morning for that evening at church. Would you guys stand? We're going to get ready to worship. Oh, you did? We're going to pray. Lord God, we just thank you for this time. We thank you that you are God of relationship, Lord, that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. We want to honor you with this time and just bring you your glory. Lord, we love you and you. Amen.
So now the rain falls in front of the opening and doesn't flood out the classroom every time it rains, which the rain start in May and end in September. And it's, um, your clothes don't dry a lot. Um, so it's just, it's a whole different world down there. Right now it's hot and not too much rain, which is kind of weird to think about. So as we're all packing for this trip, we're going to take flip-flops and shorts. And uh, if we get a day, uh, we're going to go up the mountain. Let me get the next picture then. Um, we're going to go up the mountain. You can see that little thing of buildings down there? That's where that first picture was. So you already come up the mountain, and then you go up. You can see there's one road in. You see it there, that little snaky thing? That is the only road in. And when that ends, you walk. So this is a picture I took walking up the mountain up to the next place. And this is uh, where Pastor Noble and his church up in Arago are connected. You can see it says Puerta Cielo there. Uh, that means door to heaven. Uh, this is way up on the top of the mountain. And when the clouds roll in, you're either in them or looking down on them. And it's beautiful pictures there, and uh, the congregation there you used to have to come down every week uh, on foot because there was no road at that time uh, to go to church. So we gave them their church in their own community, and we're going to be next picture right there. That's the church to your right. So where the pastor uh, Jesus is standing, it, everything's on the mountainside. You either go up, down. Or if you walk sideways, you can go sort of level um, that way. But this is the other part of the land that was donated. Um, and we're going to be putting a small building there that's going to be multi-purpose kitchen, dining room, Sunday school classroom, and place to meet, and etc. They have one room right now, so we're going to give them a second room. And that's the purpose of this trip. We're going to go down and I'm going to work these guys real hard again. First, I'll make them walk up the side of the mountain to some hours up, well, for us it takes about under two. For the newbies that are flatlanders, it can take three, three and a half hours wheezing their way up the mountain because it's just like this. And uh, once we get up there, then we're going to flatten it, probably dig footings. They're gonna learn how to make um, cadenas with the metal and a lot of hand work. We're gonna have to move the brick, the, the sand, the cement, the gravel all by on our backs, or our head baskets called tenates, and then uh, mix the cement on the ground and start putting the footings in for this new building. So we'll leave this next Friday at 8 a.m. out of Tijuana, and we will get back on the 30th. So it'll be gone the next two Sundays. Uh, the second Sunday will be up in this area for church there, which is a whole different world and experience. So just want to keep you posted on uh, what this church is connected with. So we'll be visiting the lower church, which is our church's connection here with Mount Maranatha Church. And then Pastor Noble will be connecting with the church up farther up the mountain, uh, Puerto Alciano at the door of uh, Heaven Church. And those two connections going there. I just want to give you a verse. It's kind of what keeps me going. Acts 26, 19. Paul said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision that I received. If you've got a vision, if it's truly a vision from God and you've received it, it's what drives you. So if you want to know what drives me to keep going down here and doing this, I have my boots out front. I'm already waterproofing them right now because just when you think it's not going to rain down there, it will rain. And that's what makes the wild coffee, bananas, and um, pineapples grow so well. Um, that's what's nice about it. But I want to do it now. And just keep us in prayer uh, over this next week and a half, just as we get ready to go. As I've told everybody I've taken on the group, the devil always tries to cheap shot you before you leave to distract you. And then um, when you get back and you're getting the reports on how good it was, then he does all sorts of crazy stuff to also try and steal your joy. Uh, from that, or along the way, because we're going to be doing a lot of interesting travel. I mean, we will be in vans, we will be in planes, we will be in Suburbans, not a Chevy Suburban, but what they call a Suburban, and then in the back of a pickup truck, and who knows what after that. Probably on foot a lot of the time, and it'll just be a really unique experience for those 
Uh, Pastor Noble has gone before, Paul has gone before, uh, Phineas, uh, Pastor Noble's younger son, has never gone before, so it would be a new challenge for him. I imagine by now Phineas is taller than I, just that uh, the weak stock grow tall. And so anyway, that's what's going on. I uh, appreciate the support and friends of the church. And I, uh, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. So real quick, if you wouldn't mind taking out your connection card and putting that out real quick for you can use your phone scan that with QR code to fill it out on the line. There's just a couple of things I'm going to go over here real quick before Mike comes up. The uh, women's Bible study is starting soon, but your last day to sign up will be tomorrow because the books need to be ordered. There's information in the, in the bulletin on that. We have a membership class coming up at the end of this month, January 27th, 9 a.m. here at the church. Um, if you're interested in becoming a member, contact Pastor Jeff, talk to him. Um, you can also put your information on this card and put it in the offering plate at the end of the service. And as far as the men's Bible study, I don't have any information yet, but I want to come So stand by, stand by. And we'll get that out too. And that's all I have for right now. So if everybody wants to get up and say hi to somebody, and the kids can head off to Sunday school. Thank you. All right, I'm afraid I have to break this party up. This morning, I'm going to cover the longest chapter in the book of Genesis, so we need all the time we can get here. So thank you guys for uh, uh, engaging the fellowship for you. Thank you for coming in order now so we can get together and study God's Word. Um, I am preaching on Genesis 24. This is the story of uh, Abraham sending his servant to go get a bride for his son Isaac. That's what we're going to be discussing today. But as usual, I'd like to start with a story. Hopefully you don't mind. So, uh, trip around the world, it's been three months in New Zealand. Bottom right-hand corner there, here's a close-up. This is New Zealand, right? I told you last week about how I had family there. Um, I also had a, a good friend, his name was Ian Collins, and he had lived with me for a year here in the States. We met up at Ian Lake, and he came and stayed with me, and so he was back in New Zealand when I was there, and he offered to put me up and all that. So basically, Wellington is the city on the very, here, I brought a stick. So, right down here, the very southern part of the North Island is Wellington, that's where he lived. And so, uh, my friend Stephen and I, we spent a month in Wellington, just kind of getting to know the country, and then we spent a month traveling the, the uh, North Island, and then we spent a month traveling the South Island, and then it was time to move on to Australia. So we made it back across uh, the ferry to the North Island on uh, the day before Christmas. And we had a flight that was leaving on the 28th. And Ian had decided he wanted me to go out with a bang, right? So he had all these events planned. Uh, it wasn't just driving me to the airport. We, uh, we were gonna stop at Lake Taupo and do a rock climbing trip. So if you look at the North Island here, you see right in the middle, there's that big lake right up here. That's, uh, that's like Taupo, and Whanganui Bay is a place where you have like a sandy beach, and then right next to it you have just these sheer cliffs, so there's great rock climbing there. So we head up to uh, Lake Taupo, uh, he gets the boys together, that's, if you, if you look at the, the top left, that's Stephen, the guy who I traveled with, Ian is between us, then that's me, and then you've got Ben and Mark and Ellen. So we're all heading up to Lake Taupo to go rock climbing. So. We head up there, have a great time, a few rock climbing shots. If you look at the, the one on the right, that's Allison just repelling down, but you get the idea of how close you are to the water. So it's just a beautiful, gorgeous place, great rock to climb on. At a time it couldn't be beat. We even, we, we got a whole sheep and roasted it on a spit over a campfire. And it was way more food than we could eat. Um, so there was like a Maori village. The Maoris are the indigenous people of New Zealand. Um, and there was a village just down the beach, and so we invited the whole village, we fed the whole village, and we still have leftovers. Um, but, but that was great, that's the land of something that it, we kind of don't have that much here in America, but they have, they have more sheep than people in New Zealand, so they really know how to put land down. It was really good. Um, so 
So there's our campsite. So we camped out at Lake Taupo, and then that got us basically halfway to Auckland where the airport was. So the next night, we'd go uh, about halfway there. He had a friend of the dairy farm. It was about two hours south of uh, Auckland, which right here, Tihiroa, that's, that's basically where it was. So we, we go up there, his friend's name was Campbell Hicks, and he had just, you know how farmers like to eat? Because they're always working and they need a lot of, so he had just an incredible spread for us. We have a great time, have a, you know, incredible dinner at his house. We're packing all our stuff together and uh, getting ready to send a bunch of stuff home too because you kind of accumulate things in three months and I didn't want to pack it with me on the rest of the trip. So I'm getting ready to mail stuff home. So I'm up late getting packed and packages together and all that. But we had a good solid plan, right? And I actually, I went back to my journal so I get the details right and jotted them down. So, so the plan was, was this, our flight left at 1 p.m. the next day. And that's in Auckland, it's about a two hour drive away. So, uh, and we, we had to go to the, the post office first, so we allowed a half hour. You're supposed to get there two hours before your flight leaves, right? So we figured we wake up at 7.30, leave at 8.30, you know, it gives us a half hour to bust around the post office, get to the airport, we're good to go, right? So this is our plan. Now, reality ended up being something different. <laughs> so we've all been up having a good time, and um, we, you know, we figured if this is a dairy farm, he has to get up and milk the cows, so he's gonna be up early, so we'll get up early. And, Everything will be fine. So I, I wake up the next morning, and I stretch, and I look at my watch, and uh, it's 9.45. Oh. So it's already an hour and 15 minutes after we were supposed to have left, and I'm the first one up. So I go run around, getting everyone up, getting into the cars. We, we finally, of course, get on the freeway, and there's an accident. So that delays things further. So we actually made it to the airport, at noon, an hour before the flight leaves. It took us a half hour in the line to get to the front of the ticket counter. I think I got a picture there. Um, yeah, that's us making it to the ticket counter. We all look a little frazzled, that's why. So we get up to the ticket counter, and the, the guy checks our beds. It's about 12.30, half hour before the flight leaves. And uh, uh, checks our bags. This is the old days. We had paper tickets for all of our flights that we took with us. So we show him the tickets. He's like, yeah, I can't give you your boarding passes because you didn't pay your departure tax yet. And so now we remember when we landed in New Zealand, Customs said, we're not going to let you leave until you pay this departure tax. It's a tax they won't let you leave unless you pay it. So now we have to go over to the Customs office. We stand in that line. We pay the money. We go back, fortunately the guy didn't make us wait in line again at the ticket counter, he just took it. So by now it is 12.45. Our plane leaves in 15 minutes. We gotta get through security and out to the gate. So the guy says, dude, you got 15 minutes before this plane goes, you better run. So we, did, we take off on this mad dash through the airport. Like I don't know if you remember the old OJ Simpson commercial of him running through the airport, but I, 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 I promise you I didn't knock anyone over, although that, that was my, my nature was to do so. I was controlled. We go running to the security line. There's this big line there at security. And one of the security guards sees us running, and he comes up, and then the first thing he asks us is, you know, is it an international flight? Yeah. And then he says, you know, have you checked, did you check bags or do you just have carry ons I said, oh no, we checked our bags. And he said, oh, well you can relax then. Because on an international flight, once your bag is checked, that plane's not going to leave without you. Because the policy is, if you have a bag on that plane, they want to make sure you didn't put a bomb in your bag and then you're not going to get on the plane with it, right? So he says, once your bag is checked, the plane's not going to leave without you. So we breathed a sigh of relief. We realized it didn't have to be running through the airport, and the plane did leave a little late, but we were on it, so we made it to Australia. All right, so that takes us to another story, and uh, this is a good story. It's probably a story uh, you heard in Sunday school. I don't know if it's a story that people typically preach on, but when I was reading through Genesis, it just struck me. There's a lot of practical lessons to be learned from this story right here. So that's why I, I developed a sermon out of it. So let me give you a little bit of background, because we're jumping into Genesis here. And uh, so this this is about Abe finding a bride for Isaac, right? Remember, 
Pastor Joe used to call it the patriarchs, Abe, Mike, and Jake, right? Instead of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I like that. It sounds kind of old-fashioned, down homey. Not as old-fashioned as, as the Bible, but I, I just like the lingo. So that's why I call the sermon a bride for I. So where we're at in the story is Sarah has just died, okay? And uh, Abraham, Abe is, is 140, Ike is 40 years old. And uh, let's start out in verse 1. Now Abraham was old, you know, I'll say, advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he owned. Now, we don't get a name for the servant in this story, but if you go back to Genesis 15 2, he's named there. This is uh, Eliezer of Damascus is his name. So we'll call him Eli, okay? That, that, that fits with our lingo, and it's easier for me to say. So Eli is the name of the servant. And uh, the passage in Genesis 15, too, is basically before Isaac is born and the angels come and promise uh, to Abe that he's going to have a son. He, he says, you know, well, what, what good news can you, can you give me because I don't even have a, an heir. So if you bless me with anything, it's just going to go to my servant here, Eli. And uh, that's the context of what we get his name there. So Abe is uh, talking to Eli here. He says, please place your hand under my thigh. I guess we should move forward here a little bit. That's a painting of Eli right there. And no one knows what he looks like. He's just an artist, but I like the visual. So here we are in the story. Please place your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and the God of earth, that you shall not take a wife for my son, for the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live. But you shall go to my country and my relatives and take a wife for my son, Isaac. So there's a couple things to notice here. Um, first of all, what's wrong with a good old-fashioned handshake, right? But this thing that he's saying, put your hand under my thigh and swear to me, there's some countries in the world where, where they still do this. I've been to those countries. And it takes some getting used to, I will tell you that. <laughs> but they do this to, to this day. And two guys will be sitting next to each other. And the, the one guy will reach over to the other guy. And the hand goes right there. And then the other guy puts his hand. They sit there like that, talking to each other. And it's just a way of saying, hey, I trust you. I'm familiar with you. It's, it's, I, I am, I'm very glad the first time it happened to me, I, I had both read about it and I had seen it happen. Because my natural reaction was to punch the guy when I saw him <laughs> going for the old gents and jewels. You know what I'm saying? It was just not the sort of thing that I was used to. But that's, that's the way they did things back then. And so that's what he's referring to. It's just a cultural difference. But we would shake hands on a deal. They put their hands on their thighs. All right, so this is what he is asking Eli to do for him. He wants him to go get a, a bride for his son, and he wants to make sure he doesn't marry someone in the land of Canaan. Abe is obviously thinking at this point that his, his death is coming soon, and he, he knows full well he may die before um, a bride comes back, and he wants to make sure that his servant carries out his wishes here. So he asks him uh, to do this thing for him. Now, Eli responds wisely. Oh, you know what? I, I did have something up there, so let's just mention it. That's the other thing is, is swearing. And in Matthew, this is from the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. This is what Christ says. He says, again, you've heard the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. And so basically, in Old Testament times, that was... Uh, that was the law. It's like when you swear by the Lord, you have to keep your word. It's, it's a solemn vow. Christ goes on to say, I, I say you shall make no oath at all. We have all these admonitions in the New Testament that says you just don't swear at all because you have you don't have the power to know the future and, and you shouldn't really be doing that. But in Old Testament times, this is, this is the way they did things. They would swear an oath. So let's move on here. And pick up at verse 5. And the servant said to him, Eli said to him, Suppose the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. Should I take your son back to the land from where you came? Then Abraham said to him, Beware, lest you take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth, and who spoke to me, 
and who swore to me, saying, To your descendants I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you will take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this my oath, only do not take my son back there. So the servant placed his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. All right, so in your notes, I've got lessons that, that I've just drawn on. You're welcome to learn whatever lessons you want to, but these are just seven lessons that I take from this. And the first one is this, is think of the potential pitfalls before you accept the task. So Abe asks Eli to do this thing for him. And this is why anytime you get any task. And this applies whether this is you're doing something spiritual, you're doing something for the church, or you're just doing something at work, right? All, all these lessons that we're going to learn here apply to whatever you're, you're going to do in life. But when you're assigned a task, you ought to think through, okay, what could go wrong? I mean, that's just a wise thing to think of beforehand. Think of if he, if he travels a thousand miles and suddenly... Uh, something happens and okay what do I do now I can't just go ask hey, hey what should I do now so you've got to think through the potential pitfalls first and that's that's what Eli does here and you notice too that he gets that cleared before he's willing to accept the task so just because someone asks you to do something doesn't necessarily mean you have to do it you need to think it through before you agree to accept that task because once you've agreed to accept the task it's your obligation to fulfill it all right, the story continues. Then the servant took ten camels from the camels of his master and set out with a variety of good things of his master's in his hand. And he arose and went to the city, he went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. Now, Nahor is uh, Abe's brother, right? So you get the idea, his mission here is to find a relative. Uh, some translations call that a member of my tribe. So it's not necessarily a close relative but it's, it's, it's extended kin, basically, is what it means. But in the city of Nahor, his brother, it's pretty likely you're going to find someone from that family, right? And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at evening time, when the women go out to draw water. And he said, O oh Lord, the God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today, and show loving kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now may it be that the girl to whom I say, please put down your jar, so that I may drink, and who answers, drink, and I will water your camels also. May she be the one whom thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And by this I shall know that, that thou hast shown loving kindness to my master. So, a couple things to point out here. Um, but another wise thing that he does here is he prays, right? He prays and he asks for God's help. This is lesson number two. Ask for God's help and leave room for it. Now, when I say leave room for it, he does everything he can to make sure his task is successful, right? First of all, he goes to the proper city, a city where he's likely to find Ken. And then he goes to an area where he's likely to find young women, right? So he's positioned himself for success. He's done everything in his power to make sure that this task is going to succeed. And then he asks for God's help, right? And when he asks for God's help, he's actually in a position here where he leaves room for God to help, right? It's not like he's saying, I'm gonna do everything myself. He's allowing God to uh, bless him more than he's even thinking of, right? And that's just another uh, good lesson that we should do. The other thing that he's doing right here, he's, he's basically, figure out a way to find someone who's good, who's kind, right? In other words, if if someone just says, yeah, here's your water, that's that's kind, right? And if someone says, no, you can't have my water, that's cruel. But if they go above and beyond and they say, oh, here, have some water, and your camel's look thirsty too, that's a kind person. That's someone who's showing kindness to strangers. And especially if you're looking for a spouse, goodness, kindness, those are the kinds of traits that you want to be looking for. It's a good lesson. Uh, for all of us, really. All right, let us move on to verse 15. And it came about before he had finished speaking that, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor, came out with her jar on her shoulder. And the girl was very beautiful. 
a virgin, and no man had had relations with her. And she went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please let me drink a little water from your jar. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly lowered her jar to her hand and gave him a drink. Now when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw also for your camels until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the draw and ran back to the well to draw. And she drew for all his camels. Meanwhile, the man was gazing at her in silence to know whether the Lord had made his journey successful or not. All right, this brings us to the next lesson, lesson number three. He who hesitates is lost, right? And you get to, you've done everything to position yourself for success. You get to the point, and it's like, okay, now it's time to act. When it's time to act, you act. And you get all these verbs, like the servant ran down to meet Becky. We've got to stick with the Lincoln, right? So we've got to call her Becky. Becky. So he ran down to meet Becky, and she's moving quickly, too. And, and all this stuff is reminiscent. It's, it's if you want to look at it, it's, it's in Genesis 18, verses 1 through 8. But when the angels come to Abraham, and they're the ones who tell him, hey, we're going to come back in a year's time, and you're going to have a son, everything that Abe does, he does quickly. He runs to, to go slaughter a calf to feed them. He runs to, to, to get them water. He runs to do this and that. But it's all the same verbs, run quickly, quickly. And you get the idea that just like Abe was very important for him to show hospitality to strangers, it's also obviously important for Becky. So that's something that is a value uh, to her personally and probably in her whole society, is the idea, hey, strangers are here. I have the opportunity to show kindness. I, I'm going to act quickly to make sure that, that someone else doesn't get my opportunity, that I am able to go help that person, right? And so you, you, you get the idea that everyone's moving quickly to make this happen. And uh, anytime you're trying to accomplish a task, when it's time to act, you got to act. And don't just sit on your haunches. All right, verse 22. Then it came about when the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her wrist weighing ten shekels of gold. And I hear that and I immediately think it's a ring for her finger. We find out later he puts it in her nose. But that's <laughs> just a cultural thing. But a gold ring and two bracelets. And then uh, Eli says, Whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room for us to lodge in your father's house? And she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. Again she said to him, We have plenty of both straw and feed, and room to lodge in. Then the man bowed low and worshipped the Lord, and he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loving kindness and his truth toward my master. As for me, the Lord has guided me in the way to the house of my master's brothers. All right. So uh, basically, it sounds like he has been successful. He's found someone who seems to be basically agreeable. And what's his first reaction? He praises God, right? First, he asks God for help. Then, when he gets it, he stops saying thanks, God. And that brings us to lesson number four. Be grateful when progress is made. So be grateful always, but also you don't have to wait until the, the end of the task. Little milestones along the way, be grateful for those. Make sure that you stay grateful throughout the process. And certainly when God is helping you, you need to acknowledge that help. And be grateful to God. Verse 28. Then the girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. Now, Rebecca had a brother, his name was Laban. And Laban ran outside the man at the spring. And it came about that when he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrists, and when he heard the words of Rebecca and his sister, saying, This is what the man said to me. He went to the man, and behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. And he said, Come in, blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside since I have prepared the house? and a place for the camels. So the man entered the house, then Laban unloaded the camels, and he gave straw and feed to the camels and water to wash the, his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. But when food was sent before him to eat, he said, I will not eat until I've told my business. And he said, speak on. And this takes us to lesson number five, which is uh, don't hide your intentions, right? 
And it's easy when things seem to be going really well and just like, hey, we're getting along, great. I don't want to mess it up by saying, oh, this is what I'm really here for. And, and that's a mistake. When you're trying to accomplish a task, you just need to be open and uh, with, with what it is you're trying to accomplish. And don't get sidetracked with all these other good things that are going on. It's like, oh, great, I'm going to get dinner here. Don't forget about the task at hand and, and don't hide your intentions. So, we go on. So he said, I am Abraham's servant, and the Lord has greatly blessed my master, so that he has become rich. He has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and servants and maids and camels and donkeys. Now Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master in her old age, and he has given him all that he has. And my master made me swear, saying, you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I live. But you shall go to my father's house and to my relatives and take a wife for my son. And I said to my master, suppose the woman does not follow me. And he said to me, the Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you to make your journey successful. And you will take a wife for my son from my relatives and from my father's house. Then you will be free from my oath when you come to my relatives. And if they do not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. So it's kind of, he's repeating the story that we just heard. So it is a little bit redundant, but it's important that he's, he's not leaving out the details about God, right? And what he's doing here is he's basically trying to convince Laban that this is God's doing, right? It was a God thing that, that I got here and he wants to make that clear because he wants to be successful. He wants Laban to say, oh yeah, this is definitely ordained by God for you to take my sister as, as a bride and basically take her away, we're never gonna see her again. And that, that is the reality of what he's asking here. So he has to explain, hey, this is really uh, God's will. So he goes on, verse 42. So I came today to the spring and said, oh Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now thou wilt make my journey on which I go successful. Behold, I am standing by the spring, and may it be that the maiden who comes out to draw, and to whom I say, please let me drink a little water from your jar. And she will say to me, you drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, and this is a detail we don't get in the first telling of the story, but when it just says he was praying, he was speaking to God, right? And here it says he was speaking in my heart, which it's just uh, worthy to know this is the first time in the Bible that we have an explicit reference to silent prayer, right? And it's a lot of times you hear about prayers being audible because that's what we can hear and that's what we can write down. But it's just clear, it's explicit here. You don't have to talk out loud in order to pray to God. You can, you can speak to him silently. All right. Behold, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder and went down to the spring and drew. And I said to her, please let me drink. And she quickly lowered her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will water your camels also. So I drank, and she watered the camels also. Then I asked her and said, whose daughter are you? And she said, the daughter of Bethuel, the horse son, who milk out bore to him. And I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her wrists. And I, Maybe this is a good time to point out. So this is the family connection here. Basically, Becky is Ike's first cousin once removed. So Abe was, was her great uncle. And that's one of those things where, like, it, it's cousin marriage is not explicitly prohibited in the Bible. About half of the states it's legal, and about half of the states it's illegal. So it's just one of those things where it's like, we probably wouldn't do that today. It was common practice back then, so you can chalk it up to a different cultural thing. But what's important to me is, is to anyone who says the Bible is made up, why would you make that up, right? Why would you say, hey, our ancestors who were so proud of, there was like this cousin marriage that happened back in the past. I mean, if you were making it up, you wouldn't make that up. You would have just an impeccable pedigree. So the fact that it's here, it's preserved, 
gives me confidence that this is true because they're just writing down what actually happened. All right, so we get exactly the family connection here. Um, you put a ring on her nose, there we have it, and the bracelets on her wrists, and I bow low and worship the Lord, and bless the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had guided me in the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. So now, if you are going to deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, let me know that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. So, the lesson I draw from this is just give credit where credit is due, right? Obviously, he was grateful. He thanked God for God's help. He acknowledged that. But he's also praising Becky, right? He's saying, hey, she, she was very kind to a stranger. She did all these great things. Look at all the great things that he did. He's not trying to take the success for himself. And that's just on a practical standpoint. If you're trying to get a task accomplished, anytime you're working with a team of people, if you're seeking the praise and the glory for getting the thing done, it's only going to make it harder to get that task accomplished. Be really quick to acknowledge other people's roles, and your task is going to go much smoother. All right, verse 15. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The matter comes from the Lord, so we cannot speak to you good or bad. So the point of this story, this retelling of the story, it worked, right? He's convinced um, both Laban and Bethuel, Becky's father and her brother, that, hey, this is God's doing right here, and we can't stand in God's way. Behold, Rebecca is before you. Take her and go. Let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. And it came about when Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the ground before the Lord. And the servant brought out articles of silver and articles of gold and garments and gave them to Rebecca. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. But her, bro but her brother and her mother said, let the girl stay with us a few days. Sit down. Afterwards, she may go. So that brings us to lesson number seven, which is Stay focused on your goal, right? So we've got a situation here where it's like we're on the verge of success, right? And now he's being told, hey, you know, just, just wait 10 more days. Don't leave just yet. And uh, the reaction that you're going to see here is wise. He doesn't fall for it. He, he, he does uh, insist that, that things keep moving along. But as we're pointing out, Laban shows up later in the book of Genesis. Laban is the same guy who, when Ike's son Jake goes and spends seven years working for his bride, then he gets duped by Laban. Laban is the one who tricks him into staying for a whole other seven years. So the idea that, that Laban has the potential to get into some trickery and try and delay things uh, is very warranted. So Eli was pretty wise to not fall for this ruse that Laban is throwing out. So this is what Eli says. Verse 56. He said to them, Do not delay me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the girl and consult her wishes. Then they called Rebecca and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Now think about that just for a minute. I mean, in the ancient world, women didn't have a lot of rights. But for whatever reason, they're willing at this point to say, Well, let's let's ask her and let's see what, what she wants to do. And think about that from her perspective, right? I mean, she woke up that morning, it was any other morning. She went down to draw water like any other evening. She finishes drawing water, and now, within the space of a few hours tops, she's talking about never seeing any of her family again, never seeing the place she grew up again, going to a totally different place. And that's a big change. That's something that, uh, you know, it's hard to swallow all at once, and yet she's willing to go. And part of that is, hey, God, I'm sure, was, was working on her spirit. But the other thing, too, is you've got the promise of a better life is what it sounds like. I mean, obviously, Eli brought a lot of fancy things. He's given her jewelry. It's like, hey, I'm going to take you to a better life. So, uh, but that is, that is Becky's reaction right now. She said, I will go. 
Thus they sent away their sister Rebekah and her nurse with Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, May your sister become thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. And that blessing right there uh, that they give Rebecca, that's to this day that's used in Jewish weddings, that's something that the rabbi will say to the monk. May your sister become thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gate of those who hate them. That is where it, that is where it comes from. So all right. He finally gets to leave, he's going to go, and we get to the marriage. Verse 61. Then Rebekah arose with her maids, and they mounted the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and departed. Now Isaac had come from going to Bir Lahoi Roy, for he was living in the Negev. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. Um, and some of your translations may say he went up to walk or he went up for a stroll. Um, the Hebrew word that's used here is suah. It's never used anywhere else in the Bible. It's in the only place it appears. It's not completely clear what the best translation is, but the reason you have all these different translations is apparently it's a word that means to meditate while walking, right? So if you've ever, like, you're just trying to think through things, and you're like, oh, I'm going to go out for a walk, and you're walking, and you're thinking through things or whatever, that seems to be basically what that word means, and it seems to be basically what Isaac was doing. And you imagine from his perspective, too, he's, he's had a very passive role in this whole story, right? I mean, his dad says, go, go get a bride for Ike, and Ike's just sitting there waiting, right? And so he's thinking through these things. And as he's out there doing that, uh, it's, it says in the second half of verse 63, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel. And she said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, He is my master. Then she took her veil and covered herself. And that passage right there, that's actually where we get the tradition of having a, a bride wear a veil. It was a tradition because of this in Jewish weddings that carried on the Christian weddings. And I don't think the veil has been part of a lot of modern weddings, but that is where that tradition comes from. It comes from this verse where Becky says, oh, that's my husband, I better put my veil on. Verse 66. And the servant told Isaac all the things he had done. Then Isaac brought her into her, his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. Thus Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Now, when it says he loved her, that's the second time love between two people is mentioned in the Bible. The first time is uh, Genesis 22, 2, and when it's referring to Abe loving his son, I, right? So the first is, is a father for his son, the second mention of love, is a husband for his wife. And uh, it happens af after he marries her, basically, he loved her. Which, again, culturally, marriage is very different in our day and age. That's fine. But I still think that there's, there's a lot of uh, interesting lessons that we can learn from this story. And uh, just a couple of general observations. Like I mentioned that, that Ike was very passive in this story. He's also very passive his whole life. I mean, the first time we hear about him is when he's going up to be sacrificed. He's like, yeah, whatever, okay. Um, but there's nothing really that eventful that, that he ever does. I mean, his, his father, there's a lot of events. His sons, there's a whole lot of drama there. But he basically has a, an uneventful, boring, peaceful life. He actually, he never left, he's the only one of the three patriarchs who never left the promised land. He was born there and he died there and he never left during his life. But basically an uneventful, peaceful, and a happy life. And you know, you think about that, because there's like a Jewish curse, may you live in interesting times. But the other side of that is, you know what, if you have kind of a peaceful, boring life, that really is a blessing. And I really think that Ike is blessed in that way, in that he did have a peaceful life. It wasn't eventful, but it was happy. And so what? 
All right, you knew this question was coming, right? And we have, we've, we've got a lot of practical lessons that we've learned from this story along the way. And when we ask, so what, how do I apply this to my life? Well, that's, that's one simple way you, you can do it right there. Is just take those lessons and apply them to whatever task you find in front of you. And like I said, it doesn't matter if this task is something spiritual or if it's something practical, something work-related or, or, or whatever. These are all good lessons that we can apply to any task to getting something accomplished. But I would like to take it a little, a little bit deeper. And First uh, John 3.18, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth, right? And that's just the idea that uh, results matter, right? So it's important as Christians to get results. Don't just go out there and try to do something, accomplish something, right? And if we take these lessons to help us make that happen, that's a good thing. I was just to, to, to take it back to the opening story, Ian had all these plans. He planned a great send-off for me. But if we wouldn't have caught our flight, then there would have been no point to all that stuff, right? So the results are important. It matters that you accomplish what you set out to accomplish. <clears throat> and it's important to keep that in mind. And I've got something else here that, that I... You know, it'll take a little bit of, of explanation. So before I read this verse, let me just explain it. But again, in the Sermon on the Mount, you have all these places where Christ says, you've heard this, this was the old law, here's the new law. And there's a theme there where the original law is all about actions. And that's, that's very specific, right? And Christ starts to get into intentions. And I think a lot of Christians get the idea that because of that, well, now intentions are more important than actions. And it's kind of the opposite is true, right? In other words, when Christ talks about you know, the condition of your heart in addition to your actions, that's something that it's above and beyond. It's a given that the actions are important. He's saying that's not enough. You need to go beyond that, right? So let's read this passage right here because it, it's a good example. You have heard the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. So this is a perfect example right here, right? Murder is wrong. And that's what the Old Testament said. And when Christ says, I want you to go beyond just not killing people. Don't hate people, right? So the condition of your heart is important too. So if you took the lesson from that, oh, well, as long as I don't hate someone, it's okay if I murder them? That doesn't make sense, right? So actions matter. Actions count, right? And what God's calling us to by, by looking at our attitude and, and our thoughts and what's going on in our head, he's calling us to something else. Um, so I think that's the lesson of that passage. That the lesson of this story of getting it right for right is just that. Get results. Results matter. Make sure that when you set up to help someone, it doesn't matter if you have the best of intentions. Like, I really wanted to uh, come over last Saturday and help you move. I really wanted to. I had the best of intentions. But you didn't show up, right? It matters that you show up. It matters that you actually accomplish things. And that's the lesson uh, that I hope we take with us to this week. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you again for a great church. I want to thank you for the Bible and all the great stories that you give us. And how, no matter how often we keep going back to your word, there's always something new to learn. Thank you for that. I want to ask you to bless the elders and Pastor Jeff as they are searching for a new pastor. Give them wisdom, give them guidance, and just like uh, Eli was seeking a bride for Ike, let it be fruitful, let them get results, and let them get exactly the pastor that you have planned to shepherd this flock. Uh, please bless us as we go throughout the week. Please bless our country. Please bless all of our political leaders. Please uh, give us the, the wisdom and the grace to get through the week and give us the wherewithal to get results. In your name, amen. Thank you.
We're thankful for today and for this service, Lord. We're grateful for these lessons learned, this great truth that was shared us with us today, Lord. Help us to take our notes home and study these things and remember them, and file them away in our hearts under great wisdom. Truly, this is wisdom, Lord. God, we want to pray also for Ron Hoffman and Paul. They go down into Mexico. Where the rubber meets the road, Lord, where these kinds of truths would surely be applied. Help us to remember, Lord, that sometimes it is about going hands-on with our faith. That's how the gospel goes out. So give us a wisdom and knowledge and power to do these things and we know, oh Lord, that this is the thing you would have us do. Let us be encouraged by that. Bless this church, Lord. Give us unity, great love and affection for one another. And let us have great love for you also. And be grateful for the thing that your Son has done for us, Lord. Thank you for a beautiful day. Let us fellowship together and enjoy one another's company and bless the second service, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray all of these things. Amen. 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 <laughs>